All right, so for those of you just tuning in, we're about to spectate a 3v3 between yes. some of my lower rated viewers from my weekly Twitch TV live stream. You can find a link to go watch the live stream below in the video description. You can find the schedule by heading to my Twitch TV page and then scrolling a bit below the video player. So today they're going to be playing a 3v3 on Arabia and these are a bunch of my viewers that have asked me to go watch their game and give them advice to help them improve their gameplay and become better players. That's the goal here. This is of course episode 9 in my Res Teaches Rookie Player series so feel free to watch the previous ones if you want although you can see a you know, relative increase in quality as I've been doing this series uh, for a long period of time so starting at around episode 7 and 6 the episodes start getting uh, better I suppose. So we're anyway. I'm going to be taking a closer look at the build orders and whatnot uh, in this game, too, uh, to try and give you guys a little bit more of the specific advice. Now, I believe that Jim Jim Peasy is actually the the Hun, so this doesn't really apply as much to him. All right, Slavs, boom. Quite simple. At the start, this is already great. We see two houses going down. Uh, ZZ Baby, had the yellow player here, had two villagers building one house and one villager building the other. Perfect opening from Zed's Dead Baby. Perfect. This is the... Because... Uh, having two villagers on one house basically means that you minimize the amount of time you are housed, as in you are pop capped, right? Because you need to build more houses to be able to continuously produce villagers. And if you have three villas on one house, then that's actually less efficient. And now he's assigning everything onto sheep, which is absolutely perfect. So two on one house, one on the other, and this will give you, you know, uh, enough population to work with that you don't need to build another house for quite a while. You could build three at the start, and if you're getting, if you're really new and you know you're struggling with keeping your uh, keeping track of your houses, then you can start with three if you really want to, but it's not necessarily optimal. Thank you, Chimmers. Glad that you could make it, dude. Welcome to the stream. So, he's putting six on the sheep right now at the start, which is also perfect. Zed's dead baby with six on the sheep is giving him just enough food income at the start of the game to continuously sustain villager production. Notice how Zed's dead baby is keeping his town center constantly working. He's trying to minimize the amount of time that it's not uh, doing anything at all. So he's making sure it's either producing a vill, researching a tech, or something. See a little bit of dropping off action here. He's trying to keep his vill production rolling. So two on a house, one on the other house. Six on sheep, because that gives you, you know, a solid 50 food every 30-ish seconds. You know, it's less than 30 seconds. You know, you get the idea, right? And then uh, start working on your lumber camp once you got the six on sheep. And you're going to put about three on the lumber camp, maybe four. That's where build orders start deviating. So what you want to see is build the two houses, right? And then six on sheep. Like, that's, that's the opening. And I guess you could do seven on sheep, again, if you're very new at the game and you're not really used to force dropping off the food from your villagers. Because, like, sometimes you do have to make them, like, stand up and, you know, force drop off the food on your town center to sustain villager production. Sometimes you got to do that. So you could go with seven, but, you know, just six on sheep, three on wood, but some people put four. And the thing with the four villagers on wood is that uh, that's if you're trying to stockpile a little bit of extra wood. You know, if you're going for something like a rush, a dark age rush, you know, you're going to build a barracks and get out some early militia and start harassing any villagers with them. You're going to need a little extra wood for that barracks, right? And, you know, four on wood is obviously a good idea if you're going for a dock as well. And then after he's got the three on wood, he's going to build a house and then uh, get Loom, shoot this villager twice, run it underneath his TC. Thank you so much, Flow Rider, for the donation. Really glad to hear it. Oh, he says it was a, I was a great help for him when he just started. And that means a lot to me, dude. I, I really appreciate it, my man. Now, in general, you will see pro players delaying their Loom uh, quite a bit. And they, they won't try to get it like super early, but you'll notice in all of my videos I have generally the same build that these guys are doing right now. And I like to get my loom. Why? Because I don't trust the lag. And in a lot of situations, I find that uh, if you don't get loom and you're playing like a big old team game, doesn't really matter where you're playing, if people's pings are over 200 in your lobby, that's a good chance that your villager just might not make it back to the town center and respond in time. So I, I tend to like to play it on the safer side. When it comes to boar luring, you'll notice that everybody here is basically doing a boar lure. They shoot the boar twice, not once, but twice, so that it does not lose aggro. And they run it next to their town center. A lot more efficient to harvest the boar from underneath your town center than harvest from where it stands. And I didn't get to uh, elaborate on this too much before, but why hunt boar at all? Why not build farms and crap? Well, the reason is, is that you want to take advantage of all the free, quote-unquote, free resources that you have at your disposal. And in this case, it doesn't cost you any wood to go hunt this boar. You don't have to build a mill because you can just lure it. And why build farms when you can go harvest from your boar? Uh, farms cost a ton of wood, and it really does hurt your economy to start with them early. Not only that, but uh, farms are also less efficient to gather food from than boars. Actually, villagers uh, harvest from huntable animals very, very quickly. 
Indeed. Oh, wait, if I make my color the same. Oh, well, that's only if I'm co oping. I'm, I'm actually spectating right now. It's a different function. You can lure a villager for food, yeah. <laughs> you get the idea. You get the idea. Uh, I'm only human boys. So we're gonna get shoot and lure the other boar in here. I'm not gonna go over too much of the other uh, build order shenanigans, but like, because it starts to vary from that point. You know, you start with the six on food, and then the three or four on wood, and then you start, you know, grabbing your boar. Uh, it starts to vary a little bit more from there, but the general idea of things is that you want almost everybody on food in the Dark Age, and this is why we get loom. Ooh. The Black Wind's cutting it close, but with a sick last-minute garrison, his villager does uh, does actually live to t uh, to see another day. So yeah, when it comes to uh, stuff like getting loom, I, I like to be kind of safe with that. And when it comes to your build order, almost everything should be on food, with a small number of villagers on wood in the Dark Age. Uh, depends on what your plan is here. And once you get the second board, that's when you want to start thinking about, do you gold or not gold? And that is the question, to gold or not to gold. And... Well, it depends on your position in the team. Let's take a look at our friend Kith over here, the orange Spanish player. Kith is in the pocket position as he is adjacent to his teammates and not adjacent to an enemy. There's no enemy player nearby him. He's what we call the pocket position. And what that means is that he should be thinking about a fast castle age. He's going to get housed here as it happens to the best of us, but yeah. And if you're going for a fast castle age, you want to start mining your gold around the time that you get your second boar under the TC, a little bit after that. Basically, a little bit after you get your second board, you want to start thinking about building a mining camp and putting two or three villagers on gold. And however many you put on gold is for you to decide, it depends. You want to make sure that you have 200 gold by the time, you know, you, around the time that you're in the feudal age, basically. So that you can immediately go to the castle age. And why fast castle age at all if you're in the pocket, right? Uh, you might be curious. And the reason being is... I just got a text message. <laughs> Basically, if you're in the pocket position, there's no point in really rushing your opponent in the feudal or dark age because by the time your rush actually makes it to the nearest opponent, it will be too late and they'll already be like in the imperial age. Obviously not the imperial age, but you know. I, I understand Digital Blizz, but the point is I want to be able to see from everybody's perspective Digital Blizz, and you literally can't do that if you're co-oping with somebody. Good night, Ready Teddy! Basically, Jesus, I'm getting so many messages right now. Popular today, I don't know. But I'm not going to check that because I'm streaming right now. So basically, yeah, if you're if you're in the pocket position, what you want to do uh, is think about a fast castle age. Uh, because, again, you know, your rush isn't going to really be able to do too much in time by the time it reaches an enemy flank. So you want to go for a fast castle age so you can go support your flanks. And if you're on the flank, you don't really want to start... Uh, it depends... You don't have to mine gold, right? If you're on the flank, like if we look at Zed's dead baby, he doesn't have to mine gold. Why? Well, it's up to him. I mean, he could go for a scout rush, right? He's the Slavs, and when it comes to, uh, you know, your early game aggression, you have a couple options here. Robo, great to see you again, dude. Uh, love to have you, man. And thank you quite the guy. Uh, it's fine, Shimmers. We play with people from Australia all the time. Oh, no, dude, I totally know that Digital Blizz. I've been co-oping with people since I was a fetus. <laughs> so, anyway... Uh, what we got going on right now here is that you have a couple strategies that you can choose from, right? If you're on the flank, uh, you know, you can obviously go for, like, a Dark Age rush. You can build, like, a barracks in the Dark Age, start building uh, militia. And, and you build, like, three militia and you start harassing your uh, enemy villagers. I talk about that quite a bit. The drush is a, is a strong option. So you can drush, then transition into Fast Castle Age, the militia creating the space that you need, distracting your opponent to allow you to be a little greedy. And in terms of other Feudal Age options, well, you can Scout Rush, for one. Scout Rushing is great. You know, you build like a barracks, you build a stable, you start pumping out some scout cavalry and raiding your opponent's economy. You can go for archers, and if you're going for archers, you're going to need to mine gold. But if you're going for scouts, you don't need to start mining gold in the Dark Age, and if you're going for a drush and you're making three militia, you only need to mine ten gold from a gold mine and not more than that, so you don't need to build a mining camp. So that's basically the important thing to keep in mind. Um in this situation is that, yeah, you can go for a Drush, you can go for a Scout Rush, you can go for an Archer Rush. That is for you to decide player preference, the sieves, uh, your matchups, there's a lot of decisions that go on here, so really anything that these guys do here is totally fine. And, you know, I see the gold mining right now, I mean, he might be going for a Fast Castle Age in the flank, it, you know, it's kind of risky, but, you know, he totally can if he wants to. It's just risky. And another reason why the Fast Castle Age is so ideal for the pocket is we need to talk about this concept of mobility here. Let's talk a little bit about mobility at the moment, right? If you are in the pocket position of your team, right, if you're our good friend uh, Kith over here, you want to be able to help your flanks, and you're not going to be able to help your flanks if you're going for something like crossbowmen. If you fast castle into like something like crossbows, then uh, that's not going to be super duper helpful, right, because your crossbows are going to be so slow. They're not going to be able to uh, get to help your flanks in time or really um, you know, get to the enemy flanks either. 
So, you know, usually you'll see people in the pocket position fast castling into something like knights. Now, in the pocket position, you could certainly go for scouts, as scouts are plenty mobile, right? It's just that, again, by the time your scouts get to your opponent, they'll have more time to prepare. And when it comes to knights, if you're raiding your opponent's flank, your flank will almost always be an age behind the pockets, right? Like we expect Zed's, uh, Zed's dead baby to be in the feudal age. Uh, when the knights arrive here from, let's say, the Black Winds, uh, Zed's dead baby will not be prepared for it because he can make spearmen because he's in the feudal age and spearmen are a counter to, uh, you know, cavalry units. They're not very good against knights. You need a ton of spearmen to actually be able to do too much there. So, uh, the knights there are definitely a huge power spike getting to the castle age. Gives them a very, very big advantage here. This scout harassment is going to do so much damage on Jim Peasy's villagers here. Tomo Sapien on fire! Wow, he's going to pick off uh, two villagers for free, and that, my friends, is why you'll see pro teams, uh, you know, they'll delay Loom, but they will get it right before they click up to Feudal or in the early Feudal Age. If they think they're going to get poked uh, down, then, yeah, you certainly want to get that Loom, and he's getting it now, but he lost two bills for it. And the reason that pros do delay Loom a little bit is because they're always thinking about uh, strengthening their eco and t getting little, like every little early game edge that they can. And the amount of time it takes to research Loom is exactly the same amount of time it takes to create a villager. So if you delay Loom, you have an extra villager. It makes sense, hopefully, right? However, if you lose two villagers, getting Loom, not really worthwhile. So you got to think about it this way. If you lose two villas there, then uh, Loom definitely the, the way to go here. Uh, and now Jim Peasy certainly understands that. Zed Zed Baby being uh, pretty greedy here, going for a fast castleage, and uh, you know some signals for that as he's going on deer, he's been mining some gold. I love that he's been using his buildings as sort of a makeshift wall off. That's actually pretty cool here, uh, making sure that nothing goes to waste. And this wall up setup is pretty good. He's going to be able to fast castleage. Presumably, he's going to go for something like knights. Uh, and yeah, now if you don't have access to knights and you're like a Mesoamerican civ, it really depends. Uh, it really, really depends on your position in the team. I mean, Eagle Warriors is a thought if you're a uh, Mesoamerican Civ, but generally if you're the Mayans, you know, Plumed Archers are the way to go. 99% of the time you'll go heavy on stone going to Plumed Archers in the pocket. Uh, if you're the Aztecs in the pocket, that kind of sucks. But if you're on the flank, you can always go Expos and whatnot. Oh, I mean, yeah, you could Digital Blizz, yes. Uh, but in general, like, I'm, I'm trying to talk about Things that aren't incredibly situational don't require too much coordination, like general broad things that, you know, you can expect to see in most games, and you won't usually see a crossbow rush in a team game if you're the pocket by putting your archer rangers in your allies' base instead of yours. Why? Because as Robo points out, uh, then the enemy pocket will just send knights to your base, and then you cannot afford that. Now, it can definitely actually work, uh, and there is room for innovation, and I always like to... You know, encourage people to experiment outside of the metagame and try and have fun with their friends. If you're not playing in a tournament, you don't need to night rush every single game. Sure, it can totally work. It's just in general, um, it's not going to be as effective. So yeah, if you guys have any questions, please do ask me them. The Twitch chat is now is a great time for me to explain any concepts that you're not quite sure of. Well, I might not be the best player in the universe here. I do think I have a pretty broad understanding of the game, and it's my goal to give you guys the tools that, uh, so that you can understand the game a little bit better and become a very, very strong player someday. To give you guys the tools that you need to go become a great player at AUE2. Now, the teams here do look a little bit uh, suspiciously balanced, as Zed's Dead Baby is actually quite better than his rating suggests. He is a little ahead in the score right now because he went for a fast castle age. And this dude is greedy. The disrespect here from Zed. He's going for a, a town center at the front because, again, he doesn't really think he's going to get pressured. And he's uh, presumably going for knights at this point if we go check his stable. Or he might not be making them at all. And he's just going for a little bit of a boom. Double TC. Wow. I don't know, Mr. Bones. He might be a bug. Well, you build a castle for plumed archers as soon as you get to the castle age. Ideally, tough man. Some people build one TC first, but ideally you uh, want it, like, basically as soon as possible. So you fast castle age and you build a castle. And thankfully, the Mayan eco is strong enough because their resources last 20% longer and they start with an extra, an extra villager that they are actually able to get away with that usually. So you start heavily mining stone in the feudal age, generally speaking. Hello, Manga died! Hopefully that makes sense in some way. And Aztec Pocket does suck, yes. I mean, yeah, you totally could win screen wipers, yeah. Um, the thing here is, yeah, I'm just trying to talk about more, like, general strategies, but it's something that uh, you totally can do. Aztec Pocket's not completely useless. Uh, it's just it has some disadvantages, but the Aztecs are so strong on the flank due to the fact that they start with extra gold because they get loom for free, so they can go for a 5 militia rush, and that kind of secures the early game mostly. And also the fact that their villagers carry more resources means they walk, spend less time walking. I didn't understand this as a kid. I was like, why is holding extra resources better? And that's what makes Wheelbarrow so good, is your villagers spend less time walking 
uh, they make fewer trips back to the TC, and you'd be surprised how much that makes a difference. And their military is create 15% faster, so... Strong, strong! So, yeah. We see a bunch of TCs coming down here from Zed's Zed, baby. It's very, very greedy, considering he's on the flank, but Zed doesn't really care right now. Kith also up to the Castle Age. If you're... Okay, basically the most important thing that I can recommend to you guys, if you're... Uh, if you're falling behind, right, and you don't really know where you're going wrong, and you just seem to be getting owned by everybody, and you're just too slow, keep an eye on your TC. Keep pressing that H button to bring you back to your town center, and C or V or A or whatever your create villager hotkey is, so you press H and then create a villager. And just make sure you're constantly doing that, because you want to get to half of the max population of the game uh, as villagers, like, as soon as humanly possible. Like, your town center should always be doing something, and you never want to fall behind in population. I covered this a little bit in my previous episode of Res Teaches Rookie Players, where you guys can see that some players in the early game did fall behind in villagers due to some idle time. Jim PZ, it looks like almost everybody went for like a somewhat fast castle age and didn't really rush each other, and... Uh, you know, that, that that's fine, but generally speaking, uh, it could have been a missed opportunity in some of these cases, I guess, is that a lot of these players were really vulnerable to start in. Poor old Jim PZ here, he went for a spearman, I guess, anticipating knights, but... Uh, you know, the, the archers from the flank is pretty common, and the crossbowmen as well, once we move on to the castle age, expect Homo Sapien to be going for the crossbow upgrade pretty soon, that opening up with so many spearmen is kind of, uh, not gonna pay off in this specific situation here. As, uh, yeah, the spearmen are just gonna get owned by the archers, the archers have way too much damage for this zero piece armor to handle. How many farms does sustain villager production from one TC? I actually am not 100% sure how many farms that would take. Presumably six. I think it would take about six, I think. Anyway, I see some knights coming out here, and these spearmen are actually going to be pretty good if the scout rush ever came, and it did not come, or if the knights come, and knights are inevitably on the way. The black winds here moving out. I am surprised to see that so few people have actually, like, moved out with their guys yet. I mean, Kith is finally moving out, but this is 23 minutes in an Arabia game. I mean, obviously these guys are super new, so we don't expect perfection, but everybody here is being a little bit on the greedy side of things and not quite moving out yet. Uh, and a lot of this will take uh, practice, of course. My job is to teach you the concepts, and then execution will take a lot of practice, obviously. My favorite sim to play as Apple Swag is the Britons. Now, this is some really unfortunate timing for Becca over here, aka Black Oakley's, our Red Italians player. Uh, she is in quite a lot of trouble right now, as uh, you know, Becca here does not have any military, and she went for two town centers right off the bat, and that's pretty greedy, being on the flank. On the flank, if you're not going to rush, which is potentially sometimes okay uh, you need to be able to think of a plan if you do get rushed and in this case she doesn't really have a game plan she has a siege workshop here which is a you know generally a great choice against enemy crossbowmen but uh, it's not gonna do anything against these knights unfortunately the mangonel here has a minimum range is gonna die to those knights quite easily is gonna die to those knights quite easily so uh, yeah the minimum range here is just gonna get picked off by that scout uh, Becca could really use some help so perhaps uh, some knights or camels uh, are on the way from the Black Winds, and they are, so that's going to be pretty good here. Black Winds is actually Byzantines. You could go camels in the pocket position here, and the camels would actually be very, very good against these knights and would be able to help out Becca quite a bit. Becca does actually get the town center up, so that's really, really good. Our red player here gets the town center to protect her villagers and these knights from the Black Winds. He's all over the place. I'm surprised he's not pushing out, though. I'm surprised that most of these players aren't pushing out. It's good to see that... You know, the opposing team here is going to put on a lot of pressure here. Thank you so much for the sub, uh, Robo. Really appreciate him, my man. Robo does a lot of work for the community. He's seriously a great guy. What I like is that there are, there are pro players out there. Well, I mean, you can't. I guess you can't really call Robo a pro player, but in the HD community, he's definitely one of the higher rated players, right? Uh, he's a, Robo's a skilled player, right? And he shares his gift with other people. He does a lot of work for the community. He does mod the AOE2 subreddit. Uh, and occasionally he does videos from time to time. He helped organize the uh, the AOE2 uh, subreddit tournament as well. So yeah, he shares his gift with other people. And that's pretty cool. It's one thing to be good at the game. It's another thing to go impart your knowledge onto other people. Either way, we see that Kith here is getting chased back a little bit. And I do like to see that Kith here is he's prioritizing his upgrades in the, in the right order. Uh, he's got the defense upgrade here, so he'll be taking less damage from those town center shots. Great, great four rating, super duper important that you take less damage from those ranged units. Uh, and uh, the bloodlines as well, again, it's all about allowing yourself to uh, raid a little bit more efficiently by taking less damage from those ranged units. You get to do more damage, uh, ironically, by having a lower attack stat and a higher defense stat because you live long enough to actually get more hits off. I think that, uh, 
Becca will be fine here. She is finally making some crossbowmen, uh, which is pretty, pretty good. These three town centers here, I mean, I know that building an economy is super duper important, but when you're playing on a map like Arabia, which I'm assuming that these guys don't play too much of, right? But when you're playing on a map like Arabia, you want to, like, start thinking, like, before 20 minutes in, you need some sort of, you need some sort of military. Like, you need, you need military. Hello, Andre's Rod! He's been promoted to pro status, yes. Robo the Pro! He's quite good. Um... So when, uh, when you look at, like, a map like Arabia, I mean, this map is so open, right? Like, compared to Black Forest, the, there's not nearly enough uh, choke points to really wall up. It's very hard to defend this, and I love the decision on the Blackwind's part to throw in a couple camels here, deal with those knights. It's gonna be gonna be great here. And it's finally his uh, decision to keep all those uh, keep all those knights defensively stationed in Jim Peasy's base will pay off here. However, he's got them on defensive stance, and you didn't notice Jim Peasy as well. His spearmen not positioned correctly. He got forging first, which is not ideal in this situation, as he's going to want the defense upgrade so he can live longer to go deal more damage. Eh, but I guess against knights, forging is still okay. Uh, either way, they're going to have to start doing something about this, as Jim Peasy getting raided real hard. And the Black Winds doing some serious work for his team. He's trying to... Uh, do his best here in a, in a really, really rough situation. Zed's dead baby, booming up quite a bit. And yeah, I mean, like, honestly, like, getting a huge eco is, is very, very important in these games. But, like, before 20 minutes, you want to make something with military. Uh, Chimmer says, Resonance 22, when rushing with archer scouts, is it better to send the first troops out to harass or wait to leave a small amount of them first? It depends if your opponent has any way to defend against it. I would say it's okay to, you know, send out your scouts, like, one at a time if your opponent is not prepared at all. But in general, you want to wait to leave about four of something. Uh, you want to have about four of something in general So in this case we see that the eco damage here is gonna be pretty pretty strong on Becca because Becca does have to ring The town bell on on the town centers and that means those villagers aren't working so they might as well be dead good news is Jim Peasy is able to defend this and Really like the greed from uh, the black winds team over here is, is definitely gonna punish them uh, whereas in Zed's dead baby's case I mean he was extremely greedy too, but he did start building knights sooner. So before you put down the two TCs, I think it's important to think of a plan for uh, when you get attacked. So maybe like one extra TC at the start is fine, but like uh, the double TC from some of these guys is a little, a little bit greedy. I see that Jim Peasy is actually a little bit behind just in general here, and he only started getting pressured now. And what this signifies to me is he must be behind substantially from a population standpoint. Oh my god! He's at 32 population, 31 minutes in, that's like a pop a minute. And considering that you make bills in, is it like 25 seconds or something? Welcome to the stream, good Apollo, aka Nathaniel Garo. Hello, some check dude, welcome back. Um... Wow, yeah, um, that's that's pretty bad. So Jim Peasy must have some serious town center idle time, and we've caught him red-handed, guys. Uh-oh. Give this guy a stern little look, as Jim Peasy here has had the TC idle time. Ooh! This TC on the other side is idle, too, and, uh, the one thing that Jim Peasy is, is missing to turn himself, you know, so he can go full Super Saiyan, he'll become 2K rated just overnight. Overnight like that. He'll just wake up tomorrow and become the Viper if he just keeps spamming the H key on his keyboard to jump between his town centers because he's got two but one of them's not making bills right now so Jim Peasy falling super behind on the pop I mean you look at Zed's dead baby he's like a sumo wrestler right now the dude is massive up to the 97 population three times the pop and he's pressuring with the battering rams great choice here to go blow down these walls pushing here at the elite skirms he's making counter units to Becca's crossbowmen and uh, Becca here's got to start making um, some mangonels and stuff to go deal with it. This castle is actually a good decision on her part, but it might be mispositioned. Why? Because Zed's dead baby is going the other way. And if Zed doesn't actually walk this direction, this castle doesn't do anything. Zed can just walk in here and go raid this eco. And that's why usually when I go for my castles, I like to put them next to my farms in a place to protect my eco so I don't have to pull back my guys and prevent some raiding. I think putting the castle right here, I think would have been a good idea. Because this means that even though Zed gets in here, can he really do something? Is no technique forbidden, or is raiding forbidden in this case? That's the question. Is Zed will not really be able to, uh, you know, force these uh, town centers to be rung. I mean, like, she could also build the, tea, like, the castle, like, here or here. I, I would like it a little bit closer to these town centers. Because here, the, the castle's, like, forward enough that, like, she can't actually reasonably defend this. And, uh, you know, um, you know, our red player over here is running into that issue right now where... There's nothing to there's nothing to protect this castle. This castle is a little bit too far out. It's on the other side of these walls. Not so good here. Blackwind's trying his best. It looks like the teams weren't quite fair despite the ratings being relatively even. And I feel like this is just uh, a result of the rating system in AoE2. I mean, you never really know 
how good a player is by looking at their rating, and that's one of the problems, um, is that it, it can be kind of tricky to get, get a fair game in these case. Kith here coming in for the kill, going in for the flank. Gonna try and pincer him in here. Now, see, Zed's dead baby again. He is a really aggressive forward castle, like, you know, you know, Red's forward castle here, Becca's, is it's forward, uh, but the difference here is that, uh, Zed's able to protect this, actually. He has he has units here at the base of this castle, and he has the advantage in this case. And a forward castle is great to press an advantage that you already have. But when you're behind, or you're concerned about being raided, you want to think about your defensive options. And, well, uh, right now, not looking so good for this team. The black ones, though, I have to say, is playing out of his mind. He's trying his best to defend both of his flanks at the same time. Jim PC right now is just suffering from a little bit of that town center idle... Uh, Itis, uh, really, like, that is the biggest thing he could do to improve on. Also, his economy was a little bit imbalanced. He had so much on gold, but he wasn't really spending it. And Becca's getting punished in this case because she didn't really have too much military in the early game. Also, they're getting, like, 2v1.5 in this case. Uh, the Black Winds with the Camels does have the advantage here, and, and this is going to be really good. He's got a great army comp for this specific case. He's going to be able to shred through all those other cavalry units. Camels are a great way to go deal with knights, because they're a lot more mobile than uh, than spearmen, so they don't get kited as easily. Kith's going to put in a lot of pressure here, and, you know, when it comes to execution, it will take practice. It will take a lot of practice. And Vanla's talking a little bit about the town bell. In general, you won't see most uh, skilled uh, top players ring the town bell. They will usually drag a box around their villagers, right? And they will try and put them into uh, the town center. So they'll just drag a box around uh, their villagers and they'll just like press G uh, to go garrison them in the TC. Um, and, and the reason being is that the, the town bell will cause a lot of your villagers that aren't actually under immediate threat to be idle. In this case, you know, these two town centers worth of villagers are not being pressured that hard. So they do not need to be in the town center. But a couple of these... Uh, you know, villagers over here on these farms do need to be protected. Said Stead Baby going with the most aggressive forward ever. He is like everything outside of his own base. The dude is being greedy as hell. And if anyone actually attacked him, and no one really has, uh, he would actually be in deep trouble. As Zed's Dead Baby has like no military buildings in his base, he has no defensive castles, he's all in here. And this is a situation where, while, uh, you know, Beck is taking a lot of punishment, our red player over here, Zed's Dead Baby, the yellow player, is uh, actually in a very vulnerable position here. Uh, same thing with Kith. Uh, I mean, Kith is building a defensive castle in a fantastic position. Good on you, Kith. This is perfect. Perfect. It protects this wood line, protects these gold miners, protects all these farmers, and both town centers. Kith, the unraidable. Orange, the unstoppable. All right, well, now Kith is basically raid-proof, so uh, Kith isn't as all-in, even though he has a ton of these forward buildings, right? Uh, he's able to defend himself in, in case he gets raided. Tomo Sapien as well with a good castle placement. Don't get me wrong, ag aggressive castles are great too. And just because you see me putting defensive castles all the time, doesn't mean it's always bad. It's not. In fact, in this case, Zed's Dead Baby's uh, decision to put one this far forward is legit. Why? Because he's winning. He's the aggressor in the situation. And generally, I tend to play a little bit more defensively. The Blackman's here is going to make the co completely correct decision here. And he's going to transition heavily into crossbowmen. Why? Because he knows there's a bunch of... Pikeman over here, and crossbows the counter to Pikeman. As the game drags on, you want to start thinking about your unit counters. In the early game, it doesn't matter as much, because it's really hard to counter, you know, knights with Pikeman, because you have to tech into Pikeman, it takes so much resources. Uh, the knights are much faster than Pikeman, not super viable, right? But when it comes to, when the game goes on longer, and you start to have a huge eco, you want to start thinking about counters, because they start to become a reliability, and cost effectiveness, trading cost, uh, trading efficiently with your opponent, Starts to become super duper duper relevant. Super duper relevant, as you can't afford to throw away your gold willy nilly as the game goes on. So that's why I like the Blackwind's army comp here. He's putting his gold in all the right places, but he does need a bunch of blacksmith upgrades here. Always prioritize the ranged ones for your ranged units so you get the first shot. Kith the Conqueror, Kith the Architect. Zed the Conqueror and Kith the Builder. I like it, guys. I like it. All right, so Jim Peasy right now is in one of the most unfortunate Civ matchups in the game. Not the worst, but one of the worst ones. He is Goths versus Huns, which is pretty bad, considering that to deal with Huskarls, the best way to deal with them are, you know, something like Champion, something with really, really heavy melee damage, as Huskarls have very high pierce armor, they resist range attacks very, very well, but they have, like, no Dura armor. So anything with a heavy melee attack is super duper good in this case, and, well, the Huns, the Paladins are a good option against Huskarls, except for the fact that um, the Goths can just spam Halberdiers really easily, and Halberdiers, you get enough of them, and the... Goths have no issues getting enough of them, the Paladins start to become less effective, and what beats both of these units? 
Champions. Who doesn't get champions? Jim Peasy, our Purple Huns player, so that kind of sucks. <laughs> In that case, uh, this is a very bad matchup for him. He will in most certainly need help from the Black Winds, but the thing here is is that when we look at the Huns versus Goths, I mean, this certainly favors uh, Jim Peasy, and the Goths should never really get to that like late-game post-Imperial thing where they're huge, and they're like, I finished booming, I would like to buy one of everything. Generally speaking, that shouldn't happen. The Huns have such a strong, strong early game uh, with their not having to build houses, their cheap little cavalry archers, they can put on so much pressure, stables work faster. The Goths don't get to build walls, there's no way they can uh, defend against that. How good are camels against boars, considering their armor, Vanla wants to ask. Uh, as uh, Robo says, they don't really win 1v1, but it's pretty cost effective considering how uh, expensive boyars are. Uh, and, uh, so now they don't win one-on-one, -on -one, but they still put up a decent fight. The best way to deal with Boyars is something like Hand Cannoneers or Arbalists or just heavy, heavy range damage. Elite sc uh, Heavy Scorpions are okay. So, uh, Jim Peasy is basically screwed in this case as he applied no early game pressure. Uh, he was kind of like walled up in his own base and combined with the idle time and his TCs, I mean, he's putting up his third TC right yes. about now. Uh, he's going to get clobbered by these Goss and Jim Peasy right now is just like, oh my god, what do I do? And the answer is, ah, in this situation, not too much. Two-handed swordsmen aren't the worst thing in the universe in this case. <laughs> Jim Peasy here gonna panic pause. I don't think he meant to pause right there. Uh, T and it starts with not the worst thing in this case. Paladins are still okay. The cavalry arch is still okay. I mean, I got stuck in this matchup once, and uh, I could say scorpions are okay. It's still pretty bad. Uh, did that did that break the game? Did that quick pause unpause break the game? That might have. This might be the break that the black wins. Uh, Becca and Jim Peasy need. That pause broke everything. The fabric of the universe deteriorating at a rapid rate here. I'm going to click continue game, although I don't think it matters. Uh-oh. Jim Peasy sees the Goss coming out here, and he's like, wait, shit, guys, I'm in the wrong neighborhood. And he's trying to negotiate peace with Tomo Sapien, who's just not quite on board here. Everyone's going to click continue, and it looks like someone disconnected for an incredibly brief period of time. And what happens when you DC... And you reconnect almost immediately as sometimes you get stuck on the multi- This is the worst bug in the game, by the way. You get stuck on the multiplayer status screen, guys. Resonance teaches you got teaches rookies about bugs. <laughs> uh, this is the worst bug in the game. Seriously, it, like, destroys the game. And it, it even happens on Voobly sometimes. It's just a horrible bug with the goad. Uh, if someone disconnects, like, really briefly and then reconnects... Like, they can be here, right? But their vote doesn't count. They've already they've already technically left the game. The game won't continue until the person who DC'd really, really briefly actually quits. So, the person who DC'd quickly has to actually resign. Otherwise, the game will not continue under any circumstances. This bug is bullshit. None of these buttons actually do anything. They're all a placebo effect uh, designed by the lizard people that run the universe. Kidding about the lizard people thing, obviously. But, you know... This is, uh, this is all a placebo, actually, none of these bugs do, like, none of these buttons actually do anything at all. Yeah. Just imagine a bunch of, uh, you guys in suits with cigars just laughing their ass off right now. Oh, they think continue game actually continues the game? Ha 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 ha! It's a good joke. No, you can't save and exit, you can't continue, you can literally only resign. Resigning quits the only button that does something, and until the person that DC'd really quickly leaves the game, the game will not continue under any circumstances. Now, the problem with this bug and why it sucks so much ass, despite the fact that it, you know, everybody is clearly connected, they should just be able to reconnect. It's just a problem with the old netcode. Uh, is that, uh, you don't know who DC'd really briefly. It's really hard to tell. And the classic thing is that you end up with a bunch of people on an island and they're deciding who to eat first. Something like that. Um, you know, or we're in one of those reality cooking shows. Who gets chopped first, right? Well, generally speaking, the person, this is just Murphy's Law, the person that you think DC'd first, you ask them to leave, they begrudgingly agree to leave for the good of the people, it wasn't actually them. <laughs> so you lose a teammate for literally no reason and you still can't continue the game, um, no one actually knows <laughs> who DC'd in this case. So yeah, I hope you guys learned a little bit something about the, uh, the bugs in AOE2 HD, maybe I should do a series where I, uh, cover all the bugs, I mean, literally, like, I don't... I don't know who it, who it actually is. Oh, can I type? Oh, I can! Sick! I didn't know that. I explained the bug uh, on stream. But yeah, basically it's a social experiment like Start 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 says. Where, uh, you know, we get to decide who to vote off the island. What a twist! Uh, basically someone disconnected really briefly and reconnected and what this means, this means is that until 
the person who DC'd quits, none of these buttons do anything. Now, we don't know who DC'd, actually. And that's the fun part. You can't know. So, yeah, uh, it's GG. <laughs> we can't rehost or restore. Uh, this bug prevents it. You can only resign. Or the one guy who you think DC'd has to quit. So, you guys. So, you guys can vote, and that one guy can DC, and you guys can pray. You are correct. We should straw pull it up in here while these guys are doing this. Uh, we should straw pull it up in here. Actually, could one of my mods, could one of my mods, uh, do I have a mod here right now or all my mods gone? I'd really like it if we get a straw pull here on which one of these guys, who's guilty, who gets eaten first. Uh, as I have no idea where I'll make it myself. I don't know. I don't know if I have any mods left. Who do you guys think it is? Let me know in the Twitch chat. Let me know. Alright, Kith, taking one for the team. GG anyway. See, here you think- Okay, alright, Kith took one for the team, and BOOM! Get wrecked, boys! Wasn't Kith! See, this is when- this is when we all start to feel really bad, and the really sad violin music starts playing. Uh, and because, yes, haha, -ha, it wasn't Kith at all! You guys in the chat all seem to think it's Tomo Sapien. Well, uh, looks like the Black Winds gets his win. <laughs> we voted Kith off the island. Turns out he's just lagging. He didn't actually DC. And that's why this bug is so devastating and, like, can ruin multiplayer. Uh, and, and this is a huge abuse in online games, too. You'll see some players, like, unplug their, their Ethernet cable really quickly, you know, accidentally as they're losing. Happens all the time. It's really annoying. Uh, and then they'll attempt to force this bug, but sometimes it fails and then they just lose Elo, which is pretty funny. In a case like this, uh, it wasn't Kith, so it sucks to be Kith. But, uh, that's the thing, guys, here. Is, uh, let's talk a little bit about the metagame for the multiplayer status screen. It's never gonna be Kith. Statistically speaking, it will never be Kith. Why? Because it's obvious. It's obvious that it could be Kith, right? Look at it, look at him right now. Kith's ping has been spiking, like, for quite a bit, right? For the last few minutes, his ping has been all over the place. He went up to, like, above 2k. But it can't be him. Because it's way too obvious. Like, Kith, yeah, it's way too easy, right? No, it's always it's always someone stupid that you never really expect it to be. And and as a player, there's nothing really you can do about this, uh, this bug, by the way. It kind of sucks. Uh, I mean, yeah, people's internet connections are bound to uh, exhibit some semblance of difficulties. Uh, it's inevitable, but yeah, no, it can never be Kith. It's way too easy, guys. The solution, like, we're on the final boss, guys. It can't be that simple. It has to be someone else. Maybe Tomo Sapien, yeah. Eh, I don't know. I mean, like, you gotta admire, uh, you gotta admire HD for trying, I think, uh, our car got. I mean, I'm in the, I'm in the boat where I believe that official Microsoft support is important for the longevity of this game. And while it's certainly undebatable, and you're completely correct, that not too much has been fixed, uh, and that the HD edition didn't really do too much, um, I think their heart's in the right place, and I'm glad that they tried. I would much rather them try than not, because I think that because this exists, right, and it's on Steam, even if HD didn't fix all these issues, I believe that it's brought a lot of new, fresh blood to the Age of Empires 2 community, and that I think that that's really, really good, uh, because a lot of people, like, won't, know that AOE 2 is still a thing, right? If they play on Voobly, uh, you know, if you're, let's say you haven't played AOE 2 in like a decade, right? And you just want to get back into the game, uh, it, it's kind of hard to figure out that something like Voobly exists. I mean, obviously you can just Google it, but like we've, you can see by how many times I get asked the question, you know, how do you play AOE 2 online? Or if you hang in the AOE 2 subreddit, it happens every five seconds. Thank you, Gray Wright. Yes, it's always, uh, it's always one that you never expect. Um, is that I think that the fact that this exists on Steam, that HD exists on Steam, is really good for the game, uh, and that it will bring more people to, uh, you know, to Voobly and, and just to Age of Empires 2 in general, and I think that's fantastic. Expose more people to the game, because it's really easy to find this game on Steam, right, and just set it up, and, like, this is, I think it's a good thing. That's just me, though. That's my opinion. Uh, so, yeah. All right, see ya, evil pig of doom. All right, well, uh, I mean, it's probably, yeah, I don't know. Let's see, was it me? 
That is the question. I haven't dropped any frames, so that means my internet hasn't DC'd me, but I, I guess I will quit at some point. I did want to wait until, like, the game actually continued. No, I mean, I can quit. Uh, it doesn't really matter. This is why, this is why this bug sucks. Can't tell who DC'd. You never know. It's rarely obvious. It's probably Tomo Sapien. Uh, just because you guys in the Twitch chat, the hive mind. We combine all those minds together. See, our Cargon says, I agree completely. Still, I'm perma-stuck in bad ELO with unfair games. You'd be much... Yeah. Dude, okay. I totally feel your pain, our Cargon. Like, this guy right now embodies the essence of what needs to be done in AoE 2. He says, I'm stuck in bad ELO with unfair games. And yeah, the problem here is the unfair games, right? Because, like, the ladder system... All right, I'm just going to resign. I mean, maybe, maybe it was me. I mean, we, we can't tell. Um, Is that... With all the Smurfs in AV2 HD, like, I'm sure our Karagon can tell you all about them. <laughs> you never know if someone's rating is accurate or not when you're playing with them in AV2 HD and being new sucks when you're playing AV2. Because you, you never know, like, the difference between some guy who came from Boobly, for example, and is just 1600 rated. Uh, he's never played a game, or the difference between a guy who's played no games at all. This is his first game in AV2 ever. You never know, you can't tell by just looking at their rating, and the lobbies are often full of smurfs, players who make alternate accounts to prey on the noobs. It makes it really, really tricky uh, to get a good game, so uh, yeah. Exactly, yeah, Digital Blizz, and hello, Rikimaru. One of the reasons why I don't play that much uh, online anymore, and god, this music is way too sad for this. This music, I I can't stand the Defeat music in the Forgotten. I, I, lo I love the Forgotten so much, but the Defeat music is so sad. It's like, um... You never really, uh, you really, you never really know if you can get a fair game. And a lot of my friends were turned away from this game too, and they just started out and they just couldn't get a good game because like the lobbies are all Smurfs. And part of it comes from the ladder system just not being super duper good. I mean, there's not enough players here uh, to get uh, top quality games, and with the out of syncs and the disconnects and shit like this, it can be kind of tricky to get that. Uh, so yeah, there's just too many Smurfs, and the reason that there are too many Smurfs is because there aren't enough high-rated players on AoE 2 HD. So the high-rated players feel the need to, you know, they feel the need to play AoE 2, so they make a Smurf so they can actually play a game, and then they shit on all the noobs, and then all the noobs leave, and it's just a topic for another day. Hopefully that makes sense. And yeah, Kizzer, that's why I play unranked games. We'll never know, Tomo Sapien. Maybe the maybe some of the remainders in the game can fill us in on the details. I would love to see who it was. Will it blend? Who, yeah. Now, it's as if he's not a Smurf. It's just, the thing is, is, is that the rating system in general is completely useless. I think that in a game, in any game or any universe where you can pick and choose your opponents, I'm not so convinced that uh, rating really matters. It's so easy to boost your rating in a game like AOE 2 HD, uh, and you can still even do it on Voobly, although on Voobly they have a bunch of moderators that do check that stuff. Uh, and it's harder on Voobly. It's still feasible. I mean, you can only play against people you, you know you can beat. It doesn't have to be completely intentional. It's very easy for your ELO to get, like, inflated in one way, and some people in HD do purposely inflate it. And uh, it's also easy for your rating to get purposely, you know, deflated by Smurfs and out of syncs. So, you know, if you can pick and choose your opponents, I don't really, I'm not a huge fan of the whole rating system. So, the thing here is Zed's Dead Baby is not a Smurf, it's just that everyone's rating is different, especially having one rating for all these different maps uh, is kind of silly, because there are plenty of people who are really good at Black Forest who can't play Arabia. Hopefully that makes sense. Well, Tomo Sapien, back on topic. I thought that was a pretty good game, and I thought you guys played well. Tomo Sapien, you and the rest of your teammates, Zed's Dead Baby, and Kith. So, orange, yellow, and green, you all did great. It was a pleasure. In terms of uh, things you guys can improve on, I mean, I like that you did put on a little bit of early, a little bit of early pressure. I like that. Uh, I would have liked to, I guess, see you get the crossbowman upgrade slightly earlier. I think when you were poking out with your archers, that would have been pretty snazzy, as it does make a big difference. But you did some good work! Hello, Josh! Josh, welcome to the stream, man! Yeah, exactly, yeah! Uh, there, there needs to be, I think the rating system just in general is, is, is pretty sketchy, and, uh, I would love it if, uh, we had, like, matchmaking or something, like, overhaul the rating system. I mean, while Lubly is much better, I still feel like the ELO system... Well, they, they, have separate, they have separate ladders, so it, it, it's a step in the right direction. But instead of lobby system, I would have liked to see matchmaking. That's just me. Maybe I'll make, like, a whole video where I could talk about, like, AV2 matchmaking and concepts, because, like, this game is so good. It's one of, like, the best strategy games I ever played. I love it so much. It's just that the multiplayer experience uh, can sometimes be a little bit lacking. But damn, is this game good, and the stuff that we're willing to put up with is pretty sick. 
Uh, really, yeah, like, you guys did pretty good. Uh, I mean, like, Tomo Sapien, you can always improve in the execution side of things. That's always just going to take practice, but you did pretty good. You definitely made the right units to take advantage of your matchup. Like, the Huskarl is just so oppressive against the Huns, and your defensive castle was good. You poked up with the archers pretty good, maybe slightly earlier crossmen. I mean, you did some good work. See ya, Flash! See ya, Crystal Saber! Oh, I hope you really enjoy the new Avengers movie, man. Yeah, it was a fun one. And now, in terms of the, uh, the opposing team, the Black Winds are Teal Player, uh, Becca... Uh, Il Becca, our red player, and uh, Jim Peasy, our purple player. I think the black one's played out of his mind. Uh, he's playing really, really well the entire game. I love the decision to go camels. I talked about this a bit in the actual match. Uh, camel choice was pretty good. He was all over the place where he needed to be. The one thing I think he could have improved on, uh, most importantly, was that he seemed to be a little bit timid uh, with moving out with his knights, especially on uh, the right side of the map in Jim Peasy's base. He just kind of kept his knights there in Jim Peasy's base. Uh, and, like... While that did pay off eventually, like, by the time Tomo Sapien went in to go raid with knights, like, it was like five minutes later, there was a lot of opportunity where I think the Black Winds could have done a lot of damage with his knights. You played really, really well, like, I can't stress this enough, and even if I, even if I recommend that there's some things that, you know, certain players can do better, it certainly, uh, certainly doesn't mean you didn't play well. Everybody can, uh, there's room for improvement for everybody, including myself, of course. And yeah, um, so that was a pretty good game here. I mean, like, Ilbeka got pressured really hard uh, by two players, so, you know, understandably rough position there. Uh, she did what she could. Uh, slightly early military helps in that regard, the double town center thing. I mean, mostly, like, the forward castle was probably a big mistake, and that castle could have been, like, in uh, Red's own economy, protecting the farms. That forward castle wasn't wise in that case because the castle is just not able to be defended in that case. It was too far forward. Uh, she just couldn't defend it. And she needed something to protect her farmers so that she can keep the town centers uh, not rung all the time. But I talked about this before. And in terms of Jim Peasy, town center idle time is just like, literally like, uh, the one thing that's, that's taken uh, to Jim Peasy, like he just will add like 7,000 to his rating if he just gets that town center walking. You know, just keep pressing the H key. Boom. Uh, yeah, I think the AOE 2 does have like no frame rate lag anymore. It just has like the peer to peer lag, Desprex from the players. It's kind of hard to avoid without changing the entire multiplayer system. And yeah, see you, the Mysterious Viper. That was a good one. Uh, glad to have you, dude. Uh, yeah, I think the HD actually doesn't have really any more lag than Voobly does. At least it used to. Uh, I think that that's an overhyped thing with AOE 2 HD. However, it suffers from peer to peer. And while Voobly might be ever so slightly uh, smoother, I think that we need to transition away from peer-to-peer -to, -peer to actually fix the whole lag thing, because now most of the lag in AOE 2 HD is a, is a player-based thing, because the players are all over the universe, and they, you know, we have people in Australia playing with people in uh, the United States, so you know, it can be tricky with the, with the ping. You better when you're Incas because you're not housed. Indeed! Yeah, Jim PZ, it's just, uh, it's just the town center idle time, man. You were looking so good. Look at that. Look at that feudal time, that castle time. Oh, yeah, you were looking great. Just, like, one of your town centers was idle for most of the game. So, you know, it, it, it takes practice. And on that note, because I've been rambling for a really long time, let me know if you watched this all the way through. And please do let me know if my commentary helped you learn the game a little bit better, understand some of the concepts, stop poking, blah 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 I thought they fixed that, uh, Robo. I, I haven't really noticed that much command lag in the game. Um... Yeah, at least uh, at least in one v ones, it's it's basically the same. I agree, but you know, four v fours, I think it's mm, close. Maybe there's a little bit left in HD, but I thought they polished most of that out. There is definitely a little bit more delay in four v fours, though. And no, the black winds, unfortunately, not. I have to prep for my trip uh, to go visit my friend for his birthday. We're going on a road trip tomorrow, so no Pokemon uh, this Sunday, which would be uh, May third. But I would love to have you guys the Sunday afterwards. So that'd be like May uh, May tenth. Oh, yeah, because we're going to be finishing up the game, and it's going to be awesome. So if you want to see us fight the Elite Four, please do come. It's going to be so fun. I will upload the VODs to YouTube, Saber Saint. Keep your eyes peeled. I I'm probably even going to upload a video tonight, Saber Saint. That's right, tonight. So, yeah. Oh, yeah, Kith, uh, I'll upload it to YouTube, so you'll be able to, uh, you'll be able to hear all that. Uh, you played quite well. Love your defensive castle positioning. You did good, dude. Uh, I don't want to go over that uh, for too, too long. Uh, because I've already talked about it in the game, and I will upload the VODs to YouTube. If you enjoyed watching this video, you know, feel free to uh, leave me a like rating, as it helps me out so much with the exposure. Seriously, guys, I appreciate it. And if you enjoyed watching this video, you'll probably like the rest of the stuff on my YouTube channel. And thank you, Almighty Jack, appreciate it. I have uh, plenty of other Age of Empires 2 videos there, as well as videos of other games. If you like this one, you'll probably like those as well. And I also do have a weekly Twitch TV live stream that I'd love to have you at. And you can find a link to go uh, to my Twitch page in the video description below. And once you get to my Twitch page, if you scroll down a bit, you can find my schedule there, as I do update that every few days, so keep your eyes peeled. 
and that way you'll be able to get in on some AoE2 or other game action. Well, I actually have no idea who desynced Tomo Sapiens. Crazy. Crazy. I think this is probably the last game for the day, but I will stick around for a minute afterward to go answer any last minute questions. So I'll stick around for a couple minutes, do a quick Q&A with you guys. But anyway, yeah, thank you so much for watching so far. I appreciate the support as always. Hey, you guys have been seriously wonderful today. You make my day. I appreciate it. And I will be right back. We're going to take a brief break. I'm going to do a quick Q&A and off the stream for the day. So thank you so much for watching so far, guys. See you all shortly.